Now looking at the symptoms, I've got quite an interest in this. Uh, this is going to be hard to see, but what we did in this longitudinal cohort was we tried to look at people over time and looked at which symptoms changed during their methamphetamine use. And all of these colour bars are symptoms that changed. Um, and what I'm going to do here is summarise them for you because we did a factor analysis of them. And what we found was that people who use meth, this is their, what they presented like. They had this collection of affective symptoms, high levels of depression, anxiety, the hostility I just showed you, some suicidality and basically not eating well because they're on a stimulant drug. And then they have this cluster of positive psychotic symptoms and then they have this uh, stimulation which is the effect of the methamphetamine. Now one of the good news is things is that a lot of these symptoms, so the psychotic symptoms, um, the poor mental health and even other symptoms like violence and um, property crime, they drop off when people stop using the drug. So what you can see here is that people who are using 16 or more days in the past month, if they drop down their use to up to 15 days, how much these symptoms go away. And again, if they're not using methamphetamine, it goes right down. So the, the good thing about that is we can say if we can provide effective treatment to reduce the methamphetamine use, what we do know is that we can reduce not only the meth use, but we'll reduce a lot of these other problems like the paranoia, the depression, the crime, and the violent behaviour. So the last part of my talk, I wanted to cover um, what is effective treatment. And I'm sorry to say it's still in the lab. <laughs> we haven't really got a great lot of treatment options for methamphetamine. Um, when we look at effective pharmacotherapies, there's nothing approved yet. So it's very much symptomatic management. Um, there are a variety of different uh, psychological treatments that can be used, and this is a meta-analysis. It's slightly dated, but I don't think the research has really moved along that far. So Grant Colfax published in The Lancet. Um, and what he found, I mean, overall, the psychological interventions weren't any better than minimal interventions, but then he went and pulled out some of the better, um, more intensive psychological therapies, such as contingency management, CBT, and he, they had a modest effect. They were better than providing a, a brochure or um, information to people. So just to recap that, what we do know works really well is actually contingency management, and there's some evidence for cognitive behavioural therapy. Uh, my colleagues have just done another meta-analysis and they're a little bit doubtful about the CBT actually, but definitely the contingency management is working. But in order to get these things to work, they need to be given in a pretty intensive way. You can't just give someone two or three sessions of counselling. These people got two to three months of weekly counselling. But what happens in reality? They don't get, I mean, unfortunately, contingency management. Who's familiar with contingency management? Okay, some of you. So for those of you who are not, it, I mean, a very simplistic model will be paying people for clean urines. But if you get a number of days in a row clean, you get more money. So it's a bit um, like a reinforcement model. Um, and the CBT is like, uh, you really need a, a good clinical psychologist to administer that, so it's quite intensive. And for that reason, when you look into practice, what we have is not usually not those models of care. What we have is someone goes to detox. As Jackie Lambie said, we need to have more detox and send people to some island like Manus or somewhere to fix them all up from their rice problems, maybe Tasmania. <laughs> Sorry, Bruno. <laughs> um, and people stay there for a couple of days or a few days. They usually run away because they get ice cravings. They might stay for a couple of weeks. Um, and then they probably go into a rehab facility um, if they don't just leave the detox and go back to using. And that might involve uh, weeks to months of inpatient residential care. And then the idea is that they're cured and they go back into the community and resume their life. Well, do these things work? Well, uh, I decided I needed to find out. So I recruited 400 people who are going into these treatments and compared them with a group of people who, uh, from the community, who depended on ice but weren't getting the treatment. So detox on its own. Uh, no, it didn't work. 
Um, detox down here, this is a kind of weird graph, but this is showing the down here, this gray area is the proportion of people who weren't using, so they're all using when they went into detox, and the abstinence has increased here. So it kind of looks good. Then you look at our control group, they don't look that different. Um, and we actually did statistical weighting to match them at the start on heaviness of dependence, and it's absolutely no difference between groups. So you add rehab. Um, at between $10,000 and $30,000 per person, and weeks to months out of the life of the person, and yeah, it starts to work. That's the good news, but there's a bit of a sting in the tail. Down here, you'll see our rehab data, and you can see here they're all using pretty heavily when they go into rehab, and then the abstinent rate abstinence rate increases at three months. That's brilliant. A lot of them are still in detox at that, I mean, in the rehab at that point, or they've only recently left. And that's much better than our control group. But by one year, your relapse starts to kick in. A lot of these people, even though they might not have gone back to really heavy use, they've actually gone back into detox and treatment. They're kind of cycling through the system. So, it, really high relapse rates. Now this 20% here is the good news story, so let's look at them a bit more. Who did well? Now just forgive me for the detail on this graph. What you can see here is abstinence, and here we've got time. So people who stayed in detox less than five weeks, which is pretty common, a lot of people will go, I'm better, I'm leaving, going home now, and they go and use again. Um, five to 12 weeks and 13 or more weeks, so you're looking at people who've lasted three months. And just let's look at the non-injectors, so people who are smoking the drug or swallowing it, which is pretty uncommon, mostly smokers. And what I've done here is I've shown you if they got counselling when they're in treatment versus if they didn't. And you can also see a couple of other things here. So you can see the longer they stay in rehab, the better they do. But these people in the black are the people who got counselling. So if we want people to get better in rehab, we need to add in the counselling, individual counselling, and we need to keep them in there for as long as we can. For people who inject, which is a lot of people going into rehab, they don't do so well. For people who inject, their dependence is much more entrenched. It's much harder to shift their behaviour. They're usually older, so this pattern of behaviour has had quite an impact on their life. And for them, you only start to see positive results if they've stayed there for three months and they've got the individual counselling. So you can shift their behaviour, but it takes a lot more. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is that the counselling, there's no point if they don't like the counsellor. So we asked the, the people who went to rehab what they thought of the treatment, which the rehabs usually don't do. Um, and this is rapport with their counsellor. You can see low rapport, high rapport and rates of abstinence. Um, and, this is, uh, and this is generally with the service actually, not with the individual counsellor, but I think they're probably interrelated. Um, and you can see here individual counselling went really well if they had high rapport with their counselling, not so much if they didn't like the counsellor. So what we need to improve rehab outcomes is keep people in there for a long time, give them counselling as well, individual counselling and good quality counselling. But the problem is that rehabs are hard to get into, long waiting lists, expensive, hard to find. and when we go out in the community and talk to people who use this drug, only around one in 10 would have gone in the past year for their meth use. So the bulk of people are not getting into these treatments. And we said, why? Why don't you go to treatment? The top three reasons. Well, I like getting high. Rehabs are gonna tell me not to use drugs. I don't wanna to be told not to use drugs. Um, you've gotta understand a lot of these people have depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. The methamphetamine is a medication as much as anything. And it's their lifestyle as well. Or they think, well, I want to handle it on my own. I want to do it my way. So for this reason, we work uh, very hard to produce um, brochures for consumers, information. I mean, it's very highly stigmatised behaviour. It's hard to get accurate information. So these are just some examples of brochures that we've done. And within these, we can discuss things like, what is meth psychosis? Are you at risk? What do you do if you start to get these subclinical symptoms? So if you're starting to see the shadow people, which is quite common a common phenomenon where people see an image in the peripheral vision, they turn around and there's nothing there, we go, well, then you need to cut back. You need to get some sleep. And that stops the situation escalating. 
We also give them tips on manage, managing craving that are based on cognitive behavioural therapy. And then we end with a whole lot of information that they can get on their drug use, like services, treatment and other things. We're also working very hard to put treatment online. Um, it might not be as intensive as going to rehab, but for a lot of people, the stigma associated with the drug means it's very hard for them to seek help face to face. So having something anonymous 24 seven where they can log in and it's free is really helpful. And if you're interested, this Breaking the Ice website is available currently. Um, I wouldn't promise that it's gonna reduce use, but it does increase people's motivation to go and seek help. And finally, we're trying very hard to find a new medication. Uh, this is a trial that's ongoing. So if you're in Victoria and you have patients who don't want to go to rehab, uh, don't want to go and see a psychologist, uh, feel free to refer them to our trial. They might not get the active medication, and it might not work if they do, but our trial researcher, our trial <laughs> researcher Ramez, is so good that people want to stay in the trial just to talk to him. So it might do some good. <laughs> Um, and now there are a lot of options available, so if you have a client and you want to refer them to treatment, this is a Victorian helpline, um, just dial 1-800-ICE-ADVICE and they will be able to refer you to the appropriate service or an appropriate service. Not to be confused with Tony Abbott's, um, <laughs> the federal government has set aside $1 million for a new hotline that urges members of the public to dob in a drug dealer. <laughs> so it's kind of like we take one step forward and two steps back. Anyway, that's all I've got to say for today. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. At the bottom here, does the cognitive damage associated with long-term heavy ice use ever completely reverse? Um, from the slide I showed you, it looks like a lot of that cognitive change does reverse. It's impossible to say whether it completely reverses or whether there's any permanent damage because it, you can't get brain scans on people who've never used the drug before they take up dependence on the drug. I don't know if she has anything to contribute from the animal models. <laughs> Uh, whether the cognitive impairment that you see with methamphetamine reverses. I was wondering if the animal models can show that reversal. I think a lot of the cognitive impairment that you see too is related to the fact that these people are not sleeping and they're not eating um, and they're quite depressed as well. So there's a lot of contextual factors contributing to that impairment. Um, why is injecting ice so much more difficult to treat? Uh, it's because the, usually the people who inject have a much more severe dependence on the drug and that's because of the dose and because you get that rush from it. People get very addicted to that rush and um, the longer you have a drug using lifestyle, which is what usually happens when you take up injection, uh, it escalates. The more entrenched that behaviour becomes and the harder it is to break that behaviour. And does less dexamphetamine reduce ice craving and abuse? Uh, the trials that have been conducted to date on this dexamphetamine have not shown any significant improvement in use over uh, placebo. Uh, there are reductions in craving with these drugs, but you've got to consider that you're giving the person another stimulant. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but naturally it's going to reduce craving. But unfortunately, they haven't been successful in reducing use. Uh, there is a trial that's ongoing at the moment, running out of St Vincent's Hospital, where we, well, I'm actually an investigator on this, we're using a long-acting dexamphetamine in the hope that that will be better. The problem with the short-acting acting dex is you have to give it at really high doses and you get this peak effect when people take it and then you get a trough. So it's the long-acting one we hope will have less side effects and be more effective. Right. Um, what about, um, so there's some trials of metazapine which have some signals of being helpful but um not that wonderfully compelling. I think the problem that we're having is that a lot of the scale, a lot of the trials are fairly small scale, and what happens is you get a phase two trial and people go, oh, it's got a signal, and then you do the phase three trial and there's no signal. Um, and I mean, the evidence is actually like they are, most of our evidence is based on pretty small trials. So we've got lots of things that show promise, but nothing that's been confirmed. I suppose it's a bit appealing because of the sedative properties and appetite stimulation and, and so forth. 
Yeah, and I mean, a lot of things are being tried. Uh, I think we're concerned at the moment about whether that's more harmful than good. If you're giving people other stimulants and they're going out and they're injecting methamphetamine still because it's not working and the toxicity associated with that.